We're at the top of page 89. And thoughts stir bravely in my head, and rhymes run forth to meet them on light feet, and fingers reach for the pen. Pushkin. October 1st, 1920. Entering New York Harbor. Dear Tova, today we will arrive at Ellis Island. Today I will see Mama and smell her yeasty smell. Today I will feel the tickle of Papa's dark beard against my cheeks and see my brother Nathan's dimpled smile and Saul's wild curly hair. Today I will meet my brothers Asher and Isaac and Reuben. Okay, right now I want you to realize that Rivka has been away from her family for over a year, unwillingly. And I want you to to take a couple of stickies and imagine what your own what the people that you love look like and write down a little visual of what you would want to re see if you hadn't seen them in a long time imagine that you had been gone from them for a year and then what would you want to see as soon as you saw them just like she did in this paragraph Already I am wearing my best hat, the black velvet with the shearing and the brim of light blue. I'm hoping that with the hat, Mama will not mind my baldness. I've tucked Papa's talus into my rucksack, but Mama's gold locket hangs around my neck. The captain said his company notified our families, and they are awaiting our arrival. I must pass a screening on the island before I can go home with Mama and Papa. Papa wrote about Ellis Island in his letters. He wrote that Ellis Island, at, at Ellis Island, you are neither in nor out of America. Ellis Island is a line separating my future from my past. Until I cross that line, I am still homeless, still an immigrant. Once I leave Ellis Island, though, I will truly be in America. Papa said in his letter that they ask many questions on Ellis, at Ellis Island. I must take my time and answer correctly. What's to worry? I'm good at answering questions. Even if they ask me a thousand questions, I will have Mama and Papa near me. My Mama and Papa. Just one week ago, I did not think I would ever make it to America. We drifted on the sea for days, helpless, waiting for the ship to come and tow us. I assisted with the cleanup as best I could, doing work Peter would have done if he were there. Then, once the Tow ship arrived. It took so long between the securing of the ropes and the exchanges between the two ships. I thought we would never begin moving. At last, when we did, the other ship pulled us so slowly. I could swim faster to America. In Russia, all America meant to me was excitement and adventure. Now coming to America means so much more. It is not simply a place you go when you run away. America is a place to begin anew. In America, I think life is as good as a clever girl can make it. Very soon, Tova, I will be in this America. I hope someday you will come too. Shalom, my cousin. Rivka. P.S. As I was finishing this letter, a cry went up from the deck. When I went out to see what it was, I found all the passengers gathered on one side of the ship looking up. They were looking at Miss Liberty. Tova, a great statue of a woman standing in the middle of the harbor. She was lifting a lamp to light the way for us. On a sticky, I want you to think of as many words as you can that would describe what the image of Lady Limer Liberty would um, mean to new immigrants coming to Ellis Island. We're at the top of page 92. Give me your hand, I will return at the beginning of October. Pushkin. October 2nd, 1920, Ellis Island. Dear Tova, I don't know how to tell about what has happened. I feel numb and I can't believe. I thought if I could tell you, maybe it would make some sense. Maybe it would help. They are holding me, detaining me on Ellis Island at the Hospital for Contagious Diseases. They won't let me go to Mama and Papa. They won't even let me see them. Tova, I can't go to America. After we landed, I sat on a bench in an enormous room with hundreds of others, waiting to hear my name called. I waited a long time. 
I just wanted to see Mama and Papa. I kept looking around for them, but Mama's black hair, for, Ma for Papa's beard, but they weren't there. There were others with thick beards, with dark hair, but they weren't my Mama and Papa. Certainly, I would know my own Mama and Papa. Finally, a man called my name. I couldn't understand what he said to me. I felt nervous, and he spoke English so fast, much faster than the lady from the highest. Someone found an interpreter for me. I answered their questions. I read from a book to prove I am not a simpleton, but they kept delaying my approval. Okay, I want you to write down on a sticky a definition for simpleton. You can look it up on the internet or using a dictionary. We're near the top of page 93. The doctor examined me. He took off my hat, my beautiful hat. I didn't like his taking off my hat any more than I liked the Russian guard touching my hair or the Polish doctor examining me at the border, but just as then, I had no choice. The first doctor called over another doctor. They spoke fast. They looked at my scalp. They shook their heads. Then they called for a tall man with glasses. The, no the nose piece was dull with the mark of his thumbprint. So often did he shove the gold rims up on his thin nose. What is it? I asked, pulling on the doctor's sleeves, but they didn't answer. The first doctor put a chalk mark on my shoulder and pointed me in the direction of a cage holding the detainees. Detainees are immigrants who are not welcome in America. They remain on the island until the authorities decide what to do with them. People like criminals and simpletons are detainees. I didn't belong with them. I could not belong with them. Why are you holding me? I cried in Yiddish. Why have you put me with these people? I don't belong here. I belong in America. I have come to America. A lady from the highest came over. She too was short, like the highest lady in Antwerp and the highest lady in Warsaw, but this one had a red bun on the top of her head. Sha, she said, don't make such a fuss. If you calm down, I will help you. She spoke with the doctor. She spoke with the man who wore the gold-rimmed glasses. I saw her face grow less and less hopeful. When she walked back to me, I could tell it was not good news. She explained to me in Yiddish what the doctors had said. You must be kept in the hospital for contagious diseases. It's because of the ringworm you, ringworm you suffered from in Europe. They cured my ringworm, I cried. Mr. Fargate, the tall man with the glasses, says he must be certain the ringworm is gone before you can enter the country, the lady from the highest said. Perhaps it will only take a day or two. A day or two? I must go to Mama and Papa now. My papers say the ringworm is cured, I cried. Why don't they believe my papers? Why must I wait? It's not just the ringworm that concerns them, said the lady from the highest. It's your hair. She stroked my cheek with the back of her hand. She had a brown wart on her chin with red hairs growing out of it. I pulled back from her. My hair, I asked. I tugged at the black velvet hat, pulling it down until it nearly covered my ears. The doctors worry about your hair. Why should they worry over such a thing as my hair, I asked. To them it is important, the highest lady said. Even though your ringworm may be gone, if your hair does not grow back, Rivka, the American government will have to view you as a social responsibility. What does this mean? Social responsibility, I asked. It means the American government is afraid they will have to support you for the rest of your life. The lady from the highest said, Your lack of hair makes you an undesirable immigrant. They think without you, without hair, you will never find a husband to take care of you, and so they will have to take care of you instead. I couldn't believe what she was saying. Okay, so at this point, I want you to take a moment and note the differences that as a woman that, or a young girl that Rivka um, is experiencing as she's coming into America. Do you think that this is fair? And what do you think um, it means about um, society at that time that they would find women so undesirable if they just didn't have hair?
So man, just write down your, your your reaction to this moment. We're at the top of page 96. Some Jewish women shave their heads on purpose, I said. It is written into the Jewish law. To be bald is not a sin. The highest lady sighed. You mean the country will not let me in simply because they are afraid? When I grow up, no one will want to marry me? That is right. You don't need hair to be a good wife, do you? I asked. Jewish women wear wigs all the time. I could wear a wig and still be a good wife. You are a child, the lady from the highest said. It is not that simple. It is that simple, I said. She said, I can't change the rules, Rivka. Either your hair grows or they will send you back. There it was. What chance did I have of my hair growing now? It had not grown in almost a year. Tova, I think maybe you were wrong after all. You said a girl must not depend on her looks, that it is better to be clever. But in America, looks are more important, and if it is my looks I must rely on, I am to be sent back. How can this be? Shalom, Rivka. Okay, so what Rivka is experiencing right now is bias. Um, and it's bias, I want you, um, it's, it's like um, prejudice against somebody over something that they cannot change. Rivka cannot change whether her hair will grow back or not. So I want you to look at, um, see if you can think of another example of bias that you've seen in this book. Prejudice against something, someone for something that they cannot change. We're at the top of page 97. My path is bleak. Before me stretch my morrows, a tossing sea foreboding toil and sorrows, and yet I do not wish to die. Be sure I want to live, think, suffer, and endure. Pushkin. October 7th, 1920, Ellis Island. Dear Tova, I have been here a week now. It is not so bad a place, really. I am growing used to it. Crowds of people overfill the wards. When they first brought me here, they gave me a choice. I could sleep in a bed with another woman or by myself in a crib. I said, I'll take the crib. My feet stuck out on one end, but it was better than sleeping with someone I didn't know. Someone who had a disease I didn't want. Sometimes it is convenient. I am small. There are so many of us here in the hospital. After two days, I was transferred from one ward to another. In the new ward, I got my own bed. Saul came to visit, but they sent him to the first ward, and he couldn't find me. No one could find me, so they sent Saul away. Saul would have been the first familiar face in almost a year. I didn't care that it was just Saul. I would love to have seen Saul, but they sent him away. When they did find me, they put me in a still another ward. Here a nurse has taken an interest in me. Her name is Nurse Bowen. Sometimes she takes me to a room in a building on a different part of the Ellis Island. We go in a little boat to get there. I help her clean her apartment. Mostly, though, I eat candy when I am there. She always has candy. It is not as good as Belgian chocolate, but it still tastes very good. I like going with her. I make better sense of English now. I listen to the nurses and the doctors following them on their rounds of the wards. I have been able even to interpret a little for the Polish and Russian patients. Only simple things, but the nurses and the doctors seem pleased to have me help them. There is a little Polish baby here. She has no one. Her mama died of typhus. Because I've already had the disease, I help take care of her. She is such a beautiful little thing, with dark eyes taking up half her face and a bald head as bald as mine. She never fusses. I hold her and rock her and sing her Yiddish lullabies. I tell her stories and recite Pushkin to her. She reminds me of a little of the baby on the train to Poland. I have another responsibility. In the dining hall one night, a little boy sat across from me at the table. I couldn't tell what was wrong with him. They were keeping him in the hospital, except that he was very thin and pale, with dark circles under his eyes. I looked in those eyes and remembered something, someone, but I was too hungry to give it much thought. They served the food. It's not bad food, and there is so much of it. 
Hands went every which way, passing, dishing out, spooning in, but the little boy sat watching it all go past him. I helped myself to potatoes and meat and carrots and bread. The boy stared at my plate, but he took nothing for himself. What's the matter with you? I asked in Yiddish. Why don't you eat? He didn't answer. Eat, I said in English. Still no answer. Take something to eat, I said in Russian. Now he looked up at me, straight into my eyes. Russian, you understand, I said, but not Yiddish. Then I knew. The boy was a peasant, a Russian peasant. Sitting here, sitting before me, Tova, was the reason we had fled our homeland. He was the reason for my being alone for so long, separated from my family. The reason I had had typhus. The reason I had lost my hair, the reason Uncle Zeb was dead, and all your lives were in danger. I had him sitting in front of me in the dining hall of the hospital at Ellis Island. I tried not to look at him. I did not want anything to do with him, but there he was in front of me, a little Russian peasant. Okay, so on a sticky, I want you to write whether or not you agree with Rifka. Is this boy the reason? for all of her hardship that she experienced. If you give a yes or no answer, I want you to explain always. We're at the middle of page 100. He stared at his pale hands folded in front of him at his place. Then he looked up at me with those eyes. I remembered then. He looked like a small version of the soldier on the train at the train station. The one with the eyes of green ice. I didn't want anything to do with him. Nothing. But no one should starve to death, Tova. Certainly not a little boy. Maybe seven years old. Is there something wrong with you that keeps you from eating? I asked in Russian. He shook his head. If you don't eat, I told him, they will send you back. He nodded. You want to go back? I asked. He nodded again, and this time tears filled his eyes. Well... Just tell them you want to go back, I cried. If I go back, they will kill me. His father or his uncle, his cousin or his neighbor, they will make a pogrom and they will kill me. Crazy Russian peasant. He could stay here. He could stay here in America. There is nothing wrong with him. He could live in either place, Russia, America, and no harm would come to him. But no, he is starving himself so they will send him back. People were eating all around us. The boy sat at his empty plate, tears rolling down his cheeks. I hated him. I hated what he stood for. I also hated seeing him cry. He was just a little boy. What's your name? I asked. Ilya, he answered. His voice came out thin, high, and fra frail. Ilya, I said, if you don't eat anything, you will grow so weak that when they send you back, you will die before you reach home. You must eat a little. I stood up and looked for food to spoon onto his plate, but by now all the food bowls were empty. What could I do? He was just a little boy, a hungry, frightened little boy. I lifted my plate and slid some of my own food onto his dish. Now eat, I said, or I will be hungry for nothing. He put a little piece of carrot in his mouth and chewed. Then faster and faster he pushed the food in. Slow down, I said, you'll get sick. He finished everything on his plate, so I gave him a little more. Maybe it is not very clever to feel what I felt about this Russian peasant, this enemy of my people. But Tova, he was just a little hungry boy. Taking care of him made me feel better than I had felt in a very long time. Ever since then, I have a shadow. He follows me everywhere. Holding on to my skirts, he sits by me when I rock the Polish baby, though I will not let him too close. He follows me around the buildings. He sits under my elbow at mealtime. He is always under my feet. The nurses call me the little mother. I don't not mind so much. What do you think about your cousin taking care of a little Russian peasant? You will probably think me the most foolish of all to befriend such a child. I know Mama will not be happy. Not the way she feels about everything Russian. I must figure out a way to explain to her when she comes to visit. O oh, Tova, how I hope she comes to visit soon. Shalom. Rivka. 
So in this little boy, Rivka has an opportunity for forgiveness, to, in a way, forgive um, the Russians who mistreated um, the Jews in Berdachev, and but in this form of this little boy. And so, Anastiki, I want you to talk about how for why forgiveness is important for Rivka. That if she does doesn't have some way to forgive, how that's going to affect her life. We're at the top of page 104. I'm lean and shaven, but alive, and there is hope that I may thrive. Pushkin. October 9th, 1920, Ellis Island, dear Tova. At last I have seen someone from my family. I had started believing they weren't really here, that something terrible had happened to them and no one would tell me. I thought the Americans had stolen them away and imprisoned them, and I would never see them again. But Saul came. He skipped school and came to see me at the hospital. Mama and Papa and the others can't get away, he said in Yiddish. They must all work. I thought I'd come. Tova, when I saw him, he was so big, so handsome, I almost cried. But I wouldn't let Saul see me cry. He walked through the door and stood there, looking around the ward for me. Saul! I called out. I ran to him and threw my arms around him. He backed me away and looked down at me. Rivka? What's the matter? I asked. You don't recognize your own sister? He swallowed. I saw the knob in his big neck go up and down. You look different, Saul said. I touched the kerchief covering my bald head. My hair, I said. It's been gone a long time. No, it's not that, he said. I don't remember your eyes being so big. I have the same eyes, Saul. I took my brother by the hand and led him into the ward. I was glad to have a bed of my own when Saul came. It would embarrass me if he should learn I slept in a crib. He would never let me forget that. Here, I brought something for you. Saul reached into his pocket and brought out a banana. His eyes twinkled with mischief. I took the banana and peeled it and started to bite into it. Then I remembered how he had shared with me in Motsiv, and I offered him the first bite. He shook his head. The sparkle had gone from his eyes. He looked disappointed. What's the matter, Saul? I asked. How did you know to do that? Saul asked. How did you know to peel the banana? In Russia, we didn't see bananas. I laughed. Is that what's worrying you? There are lots of bananas in Antwerp, I told him, and chocolates and ice cream, too. Hmm, Saul said. I guess you're not such a greenhorn. What's a greenhorn? I asked. It's when you come off the boat and you don't know what a banana is, Saul said. Well, I guess I'm not a greenhorn, then. Saul was dressed like a dandy. He wore knickers and a stiff shirt. A cap sat cocked on his head. He was showing off in front of me. He wanted me to say something nice about his clothes, but he had hoped to make a fool of me with the banana. I didn't want him to know how handsome I thought he looked, my American brother. When Dr. Askin came by on his rounds, I spoke English, introducing the doctor to Saul. Dr. Askin said, It's a pleasure to meet you, young man. Saul, my giant brother Saul, looked down at his big feet and said nothing. His ears turned red. Saul, I said, kicking his shoe with my boot. Still, Saul said nothing. He is happy to meet you too, Dr. Skin. I said, are you not Saul? Saul nodded. Dr. Skin said goodbye and walked away. Dr. Skin is my friend, I told Saul, still speaking in English. Why did you not talk to him? He is a good man. He brings the comics here. We look at the pictures. I can read a little. You read English too? Saul asked. A little, I said. I'm learning each day. Nurse Bowen helps. Dr. Skin helps too. Before we, he and Mr. Fargate talk about patients. Your English, Saul said, is very good. Where did you learn to speak this way, Rivka? You learned this in Antwerp too? Yes, I told him. I learned much in Antwerp. Saul looked at me with his head tilted to one side. My sister Rivka speaks like an American in one week. Nine days, I said. I've been here nine days. Smarty, he said. He lifted his hand to tossle my hair, something he used to do when I had blonde curls back in Russia.
So I want you to take a minute because we've always gotten the impression from Rivka that she thinks her brother um, doesn't really care for her. And I want you to note some signs here that make it obvious that Saul cares a lot for her and is impressed by her. Saul pulled his hand back before he touched the kerchief hiding my bald head. What should I tell Mama about your hair, he asked. Tell her the truth, I said. It's not growing. Why should it grow now? It hasn't grown in a year. Saul looked down at his feet. So they will send you back? I didn't know what to say. Saul looked so big and healthy and uncomfortable in the busy hospital ward. I smiled at him. If I have to go back, Saul, I'm sure I can stay with Bubba Ruth or Uncle Abram and, and Tova and, and Hannah. It won't be so bad for me. Saul and I both knew the truth. We'd left Berdachev to save his life. Because of this, I might very well lose mine. Just then, Ilya appeared, wiggling his way under my arm. I introduced him to Saul in English. This is my little friend, I said. He also comes from Russia. Saul noticed the book of Pushkin that Ilya pulled out from under my pil pillow. Ilya likes when I read Pushkin to him, especially in the afternoon when things quiet down for a little while around the ward. What have you got there? Saul asked Ilya in Yiddish. Ilya did not answer. He looked frightened of Saul. Saul took the book from him. Ilya's eyes flashed with anger. Ilya, I said in Russian, this is my brother. Ilya looked from me to Saul, but he is a stubborn little boy. He tried to get the book back from Saul. Between the two pulling on it, Tova the pushkin dropped and fell open. My star of David, the one I had woven from broom straws in Antwerp, bounced off the floor and broke apart. Ilya knew how precious the little straw star had been to me. Always he had handled it with such care. He looked into my face, blinked his green eyes, and then ran out of the ward. He's a nasty little peasant, Saul said. I don't believe you, Rivka. What are you doing with a peasant? And this book? Throw it away. It's a Russian book. And what is all this scribbling inside? Leave it alone, Saul, I said, grabbing the book and holding it tight to my chest. I was angry at him. He had broken my star. But I was angry at him for more than that. Inside, it felt like much more than that. You can't tell me what I should throw away, I said. It hurt deep in my heart, Tova, but at this moment I loved Ilya more than I loved my own brother. This book, it's mine. Saul so grabbed for the book again, but I stood my ground, squeezing the hard cover against my ribs. You're different, Rivka, Saul said. I am the same, Saul, I cried. Still, my life has gone on while we've been apart. I am older in many ways since you left me in Warsaw. You're still my little sister, though, Saul said. Saul's dark eyes burned with anger, but something else burned there, too. I remembered Peter and what he'd said about my being a treasure to my brothers. I put my hand on Saul's sleeve. Yes, I am still your little sister. Let's not fight, Saul. I've been so lonely. You haven't even told me anything about Mama or Papa or Nathan and the others. Please stay and talk with me. Saul looked as if he was still angry, but he, he sat back down. My cot groaned under his weight. Papa and Mama work all day at the clothing factory, Saul said. When they come home at night, they bring bags of trousers to help them, to him. They work together until late. I help, but I can't stay awake so long to finish. Mama and Papa working so hard. They needed my help. Couldn't the Americans see how much my family needed me? What about Nathan? I asked. Nathan has a job in a bakery. He leaves before light and comes home after dark, his clothes always covered in flour. And you? I go to school, Saul said. Papa says I must get an education. I'd rather be working. But Papa says no. If you're with, with us, Rivka, maybe he would let me work. Maybe it would be enough for you to go to school. But Saul didn't finish. None of us had any say about whether I could come to join my family and go to an American school. I wanted nothing more than that. But only Mr. Fargate could decide. Saul said Isaac married a girl named Sadie, Sadie Chenowitz, a Berdachev of the Berdachev Chenowitz. 
What a small world, Tova. My oldest brother Isaac comes all the way from Russia, and who does he pick to marry but a landsman? A girl from our own village, a Chenowitz girl. She's very pretty, Saul said. He said Isaac and Sadie had a baby boy named Aaron. That makes me an aunt, I said, clapping my hands. Can you believe it? Me, Aunt Rivka. I wanted to hold my brother Isaac's baby right that instant. Did Mama ever get new candlesticks, I asked. Saul said they could not afford to buy candlesticks. He said everything they earned they sent to me in Belgium. My dear family, how much they had given up for me. What do you do on the Sabbath? I asked. We work on the Sabbath, Saul said. I couldn't believe my ears. Mama, Papa, working on the Sabbath? I opened my rucksack and took out my pouch of money. Where did you get all this, Rivka? Saul asked. I saved it, I said, from the money Papa sent. Papa sent that money for you to eat, Rivka. What did you eat? I ate, Saul, I said. I wasn't about to tell him what I ate. I want you to take this money, Saul, I said. I want you to take it and buy candlesticks for Mama. If there is any money left, tell Mama and Papa to use it so they do not have to work on the Sabbath. Do you hear me, Saul? Saul promised about the candlesticks. He apologized for breaking my star. Then he was gone. I had forgotten how lonely I'd been until he was gone. Tova, I have never seen my brother Isaac. He fled Russia before I was born. Now I wonder if I will ever see him or his baby. Would they send me back, do you think, without ever holding my brother's baby? Shalom, Rivka. So now I just want you on a final sticky to maybe make a summary of some important events that happened in these past few entries that Rivka made in her journal.